Yeah, just. Good morning slash good afternoon, Nyana. Uh, Junaid as well, Sylvie, welcome to all of you. Yes, welcome everybody. We are just going to wait. Uh, I know we are sort of at our start time now. We're going to wait one or two minutes just to make sure that we've got everybody on board. So you do still have one or two more minutes just to grab any emergency cups of tea, coffee uh, to get you through. So one or two more minutes before we make our start. Uh, oh, a chat from uh, Sylvia. Hello, thanks for having us. Thanks for joining. Thanks for being here. It's uh, our pleasure indeed. Exactly. Okay, so the uh, for the one or two that have just joined, purely so you know, we haven't started yet. Uh, don't worry, you've not missed anything. We're waiting just another minute or so more just for the rest of the attendees to join us, and then we will kick off. So hello to everybody, uh, and welcome. We'll be starting very shortly. Okay, so that brings us to about three minutes past the hour. Uh, who have we got? I can see we are a good uh, sort of number of people already in our audience in attendance. So welcome to all of you. Um, let's go ahead and make a start. And then if anybody is, uh, anybody else is going to join, then they can uh, hop in as and when. Start with a little bit of introduction before we get into anything uh, sort of webinar related. Uh, so yes, hello and welcome to this migration webinar brought to you by Ethicode and GitLab. More specifically, brought to you by uh, myself from Ethicode. So I am Dan Plumley, and I am a technical consultant focusing solely on this wonderful DevOps platform that is GitLab. But far more importantly, uh, certainly for this call, we have Peter, Peter Bozo, uh, who is a solution architect for GitLab. And it's Peter that will actually be delivering this webinar for you. I'm simply here to set the scene, if you like, and field any questions that you have along the way. Please do ask questions as we go. Either sort of, if you're feeling brave, interrupt, uh, unmute yourself and um, sort of ask your question and we'll answer the question and then carry on. Or of course you have the Zoom chat functionality as well. Uh, and I think there is also a Q&A functionality for specifically for questions as well. So please do pepper us with questions as we go, and either myself or Peter uh, will help you out. So why are we here today? That's the question. As you may be aware, Atlassian is sunsetting the Bitbucket server edition, leaving many customers maybe looking for, looking for an alternative. One alternative, of course, is moving across to Bitbucket Cloud or data center, which are still up and running and supported and still will be. But of course, another option is by changing platform entirely and switching across to GitLab, for example. So what we'll be doing today is we'll be talking about DevOps as a whole and then moving on to the ways in which GitLab can help us achieve our goals within this. And once we've had a look at that, we'll have a discussion around how you might go about moving your Bitbucket repositories uh, across to your own GitLab instance. So without any further ado, please let me pass you over to Peter to introduce himself and kick things off. 
Thank you, Dan, for the great introduction. So, hi, everybody. My name is Peter Bojo. I am from GitLab, so I'm working at GitLab as a general solutions architect. My role essentially here is to support our partners, supporting you, their customers, with using GitLab, with utilizing the, the so getting the most value out of GitLab. That's what I'm helping the partners to help you. That's my role here. And in the context of this webinar on this call, I will, as Dan perfectly uh, introduced me, I will do uh, a short discussion about what GitLab is, how GitLab can help with uh, doing DevOps or DevSecOps, as we, we are more and more calling it these days. And also, how can you, if you decide to do such a migration, how can you move a project over from Bitbucket to GitLab? So that will be the context of this demo. That's what I will start with. And then we will jump into what, what else GitLab can do for you. So after you do such a migration, what are the, so to say, next first steps to get the most value out of GitLab? And uh, one important note that my webcam is over there, but that's the big screen that I'm using for doing the demo. So most of the time I will look into this camera, which might be a bit strange. So I won't be looking at the camera, but that's it. I mean, you are not losing much by losing my eye contact. And the other important point is that just iterating on that, as, as Dan said, that we have a chat, we have a Q&A functionality here on Zoom. Since it's such a small audience, it doesn't really matter which one you use. Just if you have a question, please don't hesitate, interrupt us. The main goal of this webinar is really to have, really to talk about stuff that is interesting to you, the audience, and less about me or we us talking about stuff that we think important, right? So the, the main point is that you go home, let's say home, most likely most of you are at home physically right now, but you leave this webinar feeling that your questions have been answered around this topic. So that's the main goal here. Please don't be shy, ask away. And either I will notice or or Dan will notice and we will, one of us will answer just, just making sure that that you know that the option is there to do so. So yeah, pretty much that's it. Uh, without further ado, I would like to just quickly jump into the first half. So in the first half of this one hour blog that we have, I will just shortly talk a little bit about GitLab itself. For those of you who might not know GitLab or not, or not sure about what GitLab can do, so to say. So I just want to put GitLab on the map for you very shortly. And then I will jump straight into the demo and show you the actual process of migrating a project from Bitbucket to GitLab. And then as a wrap up, I will just talk a little bit about showing on, on the actual UI of GitLab what else you can do after the migration. And at the end of, the, of this one hour block, we will have another, hopefully we will have time for some additional Q&A, but again, you don't have to wait with your questions until then, ask away anytime when you would like to. So this will be our, our schedule for this one hour. And let me just start the presentation. So setting the context for GitLab to, 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 to see how GitLab fits into the whole DevSecOps scene, so to say. So. I'd like to make the comparison, and I think it's it's a very useful comparison. So actually, this is the, the comparison that I use to talk to non-technical people as well. So my friends and family, when they ask me, okay, but what, what are you working on, Peter? What is this? What, what is GitLab? We don't really understand. So this is actually the same analogy that I use there. And I think it's very, very good because it can it, it's easily understandable for whatever your audience is. It doesn't really matter if it's a software engineer or a project manager or not even somebody who is working in software. So let's let's just think a little bit back to 15 years ago, how, how your digital life looked like back then. You had a lot of applications and on top of a lot of applications, you had many, many different devices, right? So let's say you wanted to take a picture, most likely you had a dedicated camera, so a physical device. I mean, a lot of people still have that, but most people don't really have that anymore. So like a separate camera, you wanted to listen to music, you grabbed your MP3 player, which was literally just an MP3 player, more or less a dumb device on top of that. You had an alarm clock, you had 
yeah, and most likely you had a computer where you could do a lot of stuff, but still on separate parts of the computer, separate applications, et cetera, et cetera. This have changed a lot by the introduction of the of the smartphone, right? The whole whole point of the of the smartphone was that you can have just one device, and this device is very flexible. It can run a lot of different workloads, integrate them together. So you don't need to carry, let's say you go on vacation, you don't need to carry a camera, a, a watch on your wrist. Obviously, if you want to, you can still, it's a piece of clothing these days, less about function, but you had that on your phone as well. You can have internet access, you can listen to music, check the weather, whatever. So instead of just having at least three or four different devices, four different platforms, everything just melted into this one swab of glass into your into your into the palm of your hand right and that's pretty much how i personally or we at gitlab would like to or do like to think about gitlab so gitlab is kind of like the smartphone of devops platforms so to say so let me just switch to the next slide and put this in context so this slide is kind of like the counterpart of this one. So instead of having different applications and different devices to run your day-to-day -day life, so to say, is the same situation at many companies right now with many different point solutions. So instead of just having one technology, one application to do your DevSecOps activities, so to say, so your whole development work, instead of having one application for that, a lot of companies to this day still using a lot of different applications integrated together. So let's say you start coding in one application, most likely your IDE on your, on your local computer. You upload the code to a web server, to an application. You build that code in another application. You release that code in the third application, or maybe you do security testing in a fourth application. So this is something that we, we at GitLab and I personally, as a, as a software engineer, so many times in my career so far that many different applications, many different UIs, a lot of context switches, and sometimes it's not, uh, not the default, but sometimes very fragile integration in between these platforms. So that would be like to say at GitLab is the past or a lot of times the present. But from our point of view, the future and the present is obviously GitLab. Let me let me explain that. How 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 does that compare to my uh, to my example of the smartphone previously? Just another slide reiterating on the same message as the previous one. So we call this setup this setup that I showed here. We call it do it yourself DevOps DIY DevOps because. The three main points on this slide, I think, summarizes it perfectly. So it make it takes a lot of work to make these separate platforms to work together. Sometimes you can pay for another company to do the integration and the support. Sometimes you have to do it yourself. And in that case, you are spending time with keeping your tool chain functional instead of developing your own application. So that's easy to see that that's that's effort not really well spent it also makes very difficult for organizations to in this case it's it's worth like measure their transformation you can say that but you can also say same topic but from a different perspective measure your productivity because if you have many different platforms all of these platforms might do some kind of time tracking let's say or activity tracking so you can you can work on generating a report from all of these separate platforms and see in one place, okay, where are my developers or my IT professionals spending most of their time? That's technically possible. So I, I, I personally done that previously at a previous job myself, but it takes a lot of time. It's, it's a dedicated person who can, who need to do that most of the time. In case of something like GitLab, you don't really have that. You can, everything is in one platform. Every data is in one database. So you just generate a report from that and, and you call it a day, go have a coffee, lie back a little bit, pet the cat, and that's it. So that's the whole point here. And, and the same setup of having separate applications makes it hard to collab collaborate because inevitably, if you have many different applications in your organization, 
there will be people who will be more familiar with this one and that one. And I, I think all of you who've been work or who are working in big organizations know that how it is when you have like that person. So he's he's the CI CD guy, he is the testing guy. So he knows that platform, he knows that one or she, whatever. In case of having one integrated platform, everybody is more or less on the same uh, ground, but but uh, it's it's hard to hard to understand that how having one platform help with that. But I I hope that the demo will be able to demonstrate that, which I will show you shortly. So these are the main, and there are many other issues with this kind of setup, obviously. But these are the main issues that we at GitLab hear back from our customers and hear back from the the industry overall, the, the main problems that they face when they use such a do-it-yourself DIY DevOps setup. And that's what GitLab is an answer to, as I uh, said previously. So GitLab is one DevSecOps platform, we like to call it. And the point here is that this slide, as you can see, the different stages, so at GitLab, we we split up the development process into different stages. As you can see, GitLab can do all of that. That's the whole point here. Compared to this slide, where you have different applications for all of those same stages, you can just have one application, one UI, one set of features, and one, one way of storing your data. That's also a very important point. So GitLab, from the technical point of view, for those of you who are more familiar with the inner workings of software, GitLab is literally one application. So it's not like, let's say, the plan and the package features are two different applications and we integrate them together. No, it's not like that. The whole thing is just one big application. All of these slices of the DevOps life cycle are just one feature of this big application. It's shipped as one binary. It has one database backing it up. So all the data from all of these features are ending up in one database. It makes very easy to secure your installation if you do a, because GitLab can be used as a software as a service, which we, GitLab the company hosts for you, or you can host it yourself on your own infrastructure. In that case, you only need to secure GitLab and only need to secure the database that's backing up GitLab. And in that case, you are done. Security, security is is not a topic in that. I mean, on that level, the installation of GitLab level is not a topic anymore. So you don't need to make sure that all of your applications are secured separately. The integration is secure in between. No, it's just one application. The data is in one database. The data is flowing through all of these features completely transparently from the point of view of the user. And there's the whole benefit here. That's what GitLab can bring to the table. And instead of many context switches, so I think that's very easy to imagine, but the demo will show that. In order to do a full development life cycle, so let's say I'm a developer, I start with planning some work, creating a merge request, testing it, feeding it back to the same loop. You do it on one UI, so you don't need to switch in between. You don't need to like, okay, how do I get from this point of the tool chain to there? I mean, it might sound trivial if you are a software engineer like me. So like, okay, come on, I will just learn one more software, whatever, right? So it's 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 not rocket science. It's just a different UI. I just click around. But if you do it like multiple hundreds of times in a day, that can take a lot of time. So just the act of switching context uh mentally can be really draining and just getting that out of the way you can concentrate more on let's say a long debugging session in which case all of us know what the context which means so like you know when you are chasing down a bug for half an hour and then somebody comes in and knocks on the door and you just forget everything and you can just start from the beginning it's kind of like what gitlab does on the tooling level so not on the code development level but on the devops tooling level so introduction about GitLab. I hope everybody have a picture about what GitLab can do or why is it useful to consider using such an integrated platform uh, as GitLab and switching a little bit of gears and, and talking a little bit more about the demo and then I will shortly start the actual demo itself. So in this demo, as I said at the beginning of this of this webinar, I will be showing you how to move from Bitbucket to GitLab. And after doing the migration, I will show you how you can 
quickly, just literally just by 10 minutes or so, just set up your project in a way that you can already get increased value from the use of GitLab. So not just the repository view of GitLab, but all the other features, how you can utilize those. So you can immediately realize value out of the investment, which is buying a GitLab license in this case. And it's very important to point out as this slide demonstrates, I won't be covering all the features of GitLab because we would need at least two or three more of these webinars to do that. I mean, seriously, there are so many. So I will just concentrate on these four uh, parts. Basically, what I will do, I will import the code. We will take a look at how GitLab stores the code, how it's represented. I will create a work item. I will just create a merge request. We will enable a very simple pipeline. I mean, not so simple pipeline, but we will simply enable it. That's the point. And we will do a deployment into a production environment, just, just like that from A, B, C, D. That, that's, that's what I would like to show you. And we will touch upon the security features of GitLab because in my personal opinion and in my company's opinion, that's the real power of GitLab that you can have security built into every stage of the DevOps lifecycle. That's why we call it DevSecOps, right? So it's not just DevOps, but dev development security operations altogether. So I would like to spend some time on that as well. You will see. Before doing the actual migration, I just want to spend a couple of seconds or minutes on the topic of what is the actual data that we will import from Bitbucket into GitLab because Bitbucket and Atlassian products are covering a lot of, lot of features of GitLab and vice versa. So obviously these are competing products. I, I assume everybody knows that. But it's not like a 101 mapping between, let's say, Bitbucket and GitLab or Bitbucket and Jira, by the way. So these are different products, different use cases. GitLab is only mapping to a, a set of features from Bitbucket and vice versa. So what will happen when you import the repository from, from Bitbucket into GitLab? The most obvious, the code itself, the history and the data of the, of the so the source code itself and the Git, Git uh, history will obviously will be imported. I mean, that's like the core of every repository. But on top of that, the GitLab integration can also pull in, so to say, the pull requests, which are called merge requests in case of, of GitLab, but it's the same, same thing overall. The issues that you can, so the issues, very important. These are not Jira issues. These are Bitbucket issues. These are two separate things. So Jira is for issue tracking, but Bitbucket also have an issue feature. And in this case, in this migration, what we are importing are the Bitbucket issues. If you, and you can uh, integrate Jira with GitLab as well, that's a separate topic. We can talk about that later. So if you have time at the end of the, this demo, or if there's a concrete question, so if it's some, it's uh, interesting to somebody from the audience, please ask away. I can talk about that as well. But it's important to make the distinction here that by importing a Bitbucket repo, you are importing a Bitbucket repo and almost everything in there, but not a Jira project or anything like that. These are separate things from the point of view of the applications. And milestones and wikis, those are also important. So these are the these are the stuff that are ending up in GitLab by a default in uh, migration by using this feature, which I will show you shortly. And I will show you that now. So let me just close these slide. Not closing remarks yet. <laughs> closing the slides. Let me start at the beginning. So here I have a Bitbucket repository, very simple one. It's a Python application, very simple Python web application. The point here is that it's insecure, but it's on purpose. <laughs> so don't worry about it. We will migrate this into GitLab and GitLab will start to complain that, okay, there are these problems, those problems, that's normal. So that's the point of this whole demo that I would like to show you if you have code that is insecure, how GitLab can point it out. So. That's normal. That's not a, not an issue here. That the that the code is bad. It's it's bad on purpose. So, just full disclaimer here. So, very simple application. Nothing special. Couple of Python files at most. Returning some running a web server. Returning some HTML files. So, nothing close to a real 
live application, but it's complex enough that I can show you the migration itself and the other features of GitLab by using this code. And let me just do that. So I will use this. So as you can see, I'm on gitlab.com. You can do this on self-hosted GitLab as well. So it's just, it's just important to point out that the version of GitLab that we are running on gitlab.com and you as a customer can uh, subscribe to, so buy a license to, using the same license or technically not the same license, but the same prized license, you can run GitLab for yourself, host it for yourself and do the exact same things as I am doing it here right now. So there are a little bit of difference between using gitlab.com and running GitLab on your own computer, but it's not like these are not different versions of GitLab. They are the exact same application, exact same source code running both on your own servers and on gitlab.com. The only difference is that here, you as a user don't have admin access and on a self-hosted instance of GitLab, you do have admin access. Reason for that is that we GitLab are hosting an instance of GitLab for all of our customers and we are the admins in the gitlab.com instance. Because if you are admin, you have access to all the data on the given GitLab instance. And obviously we don't want to have our customers having access to other customers' data. So that's the long story here. I just wanted to make sure that you know that whatever I'm showing here right now is completely possible in any other GitLab instance as soon as it's running the same version of GitLab as I'm running here, which is the latest one at the time of this call or this recording, which is, I don't even know which one it is actually, but nevertheless, you can check the releases page and see the dates. And that's what we are running right now. <laughs> so, um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I want to do here. So there's a couple of projects here in this group. Don't care about them. They are just something that I will use as part of this demo. Not important for us. You don't need these projects to do the migration. You can just use a fully empty GitLab instance. No setup needed, really. All you need is a GitLab instance. That's it. So what I will do here, I will just click on new project, which will create a new project in this particular group. And I need just the URL of the of the Bitbucket uh, repository. Important, I am logged in with my Bitbucket account here. So I have a uh, I'm using my GitLab.com account as a Bitbucket account. And here I will just say import project, and I say Bitbucket Cloud. As you can see, sorry, going back, two different buttons. So you can import from Bitbucket Cloud and Bitbucket Server. Obviously, in this case, I'm using the cloud version of Bitbucket. If you are migrating from a server instance, you just click on the Bitbucket server. Everything is the same. It's just the process that is running inside GitLab is different. So that's why you have two separate uh, buttons. But, the, but what I'm showing here with the Bitbucket cloud, same deal moving from Bitbucket server. So there's no, no difference from the point of view of the migrator, in this case, me. So Bitbucket Cloud, here it would ask me to, now it's not asking me, but here it would ask me to authenticate with my Bitbucket account, which I already did before this workshop. But I guess you can easily imagine coming up a button like, hey, please give me access. You click on yes, it will open a dialog, whatever. So the, the normal OAuth flow where you give access to a outside application to your own account in another application. And this way, as you can see, it's already, so technically I don't even need the URL in this case, because since I'm authenticated with my account, GitLab can see what repositories my account has accesses to in the Bitbucket cloud, right? And it just gives me a list of, okay, this is the one that you would like to migrate. If there would be more repositories in my Bitbucket account, it would give me more. So it will be a full list of projects. Easy peasy. So I just choose this one. This is a great uh, group for that. I'm just checking if I'm, okay, the name is great. So this will be the name of the new repository and I will just click import and the magic happens. So that's pretty much it by the way. So that's the whole process. We just need to wait. Waiting is over. Project is imported into this one in GitLab. So this big bucket project is now here on GitLab.
So what, what this importing does actually is taking a snapshot of the Bitbucket project and just copies the data, transforms it, obviously, from the format of Bitbucket, transforms it into the format of GitLab, saves it into the GitLab database. So it's important that it's not an ongoing integration between the two platforms. So if I would come here and start to make some commits or create an issue or create a pull request that won't show up in GitLab, right? So it's a one-time import, not like a, you, not like a syncing that you just that you just configure and it will sync continuously. It's nothing like that. It's a one-time import. So I just come here and here's my project. So it's the same project that I had here on Bitbucket. And uh, yeah, we are done with the integration. Great. Um, obviously the demo will not end just here. I just wanted to point out that this is how easy it is. So I'm a software engineer, but you don't need to be a software engineer to do that, right? It's it's as easy as opening a document in your browser, as easy as sending an email. All you need is really a repository on Bitbucket, an account there, an instance of GitLab, an account there, give access, click on it, and you are done. Everything is there. As we discussed, the issues, the pull requests, the code itself is there. And the wiki, in this case, this project doesn't have a wiki. If it would have a wiki, there would be here as well. So pretty much that's it. That was the migration part of this demo. On top of that, I would just like to really just shortly show you a couple of features of GitLab, which I think can be really interesting, especially if you are new to GitLab or you are considering the move to GitLab. In my opinion, these are the features that are, I would say, bring the most value in the least amount of time to a project, to a software project. At least that's my personal experience. So there are many features of GitLab. I won't cover all of them, just a select few. And then you can see, okay, this is, is this valuable to me or is it not at all? So I will just quickly walk through a very simple uh, role play. So to say, so let's imagine I'm a software engineer I want to make changes to this project, but at the same time, I want to collaborate with other software engineers on my team. So I want to make it as transparent as possible to the rest of the team to see, okay, what's happening, what Peter is doing right now. So what I will do here, start with an issue. No big, uh, no big uh, magic here. So it's just, uh, if you are familiar with Bitbucket issues, it's pretty much the same thing. Or with Jira, it's it's a Kanban board. So let me just start with that. So you can have many view on your issues. Yeah, by the way, this sidebar might look a little bit different if you try GitLab. So this is a new feature that we are internally testing. It's a redesign of the sidebar. So some menu items are in different places, but overall it's the same thing. So whatever I'm showing here, you will find if you would like to try yourself because you can get a 30 day trial at gitlab.com if you want to try yourself. So that's that. But I would like to just show you the plan part, the issue boards. So plain old Kanban board, the most simple one in this case, just two columns open and closed. So I will just create a new issue, say, I don't know, add GitLab pipelines to the project. That's what I would like to do here. And I just opened the issue. And here you can see, again, if you use issues in any other uh, project management tool, you would be familiar with this. So there's a title, a description. You can have a discussion here. I won't do any of those. Just wanted to show you quickly that, OK, this is how you create an issue here. It does have a Kanban board. I mean, GitLab does have a Kanban board feature. The really important thing I want to really show here is how you can correlate issues, so the part where you track your work or plan your work with the actual work that you are doing. So in this case, the merge requests. So that's the, let's say the standard GitLab way of working. When you are working on a feature or, or any activity, you create an issue and in parallel with that issue, you create a merge request. And these two things are running, running in parallel to each other and they really nicely uh, complement each other. I will show you that. So here, this is the work I need to do. 
add pipelines to the project. Okay, nice. I will do that. I will create a merge request for that. And this is so I just wanted to point want to point out before we proceed. I said this is the standard way of working in GitLab. And obviously, this is how we at GitLab use GitLab because we use GitLab. GitLab, the company, uses GitLab the product to develop the source code of GitLab the application, if that makes sense. And we use GitLab this way, right? So this is the standard approach because that's our approach to software development. But obviously, you don't need to use it like this. So it's you can use GitLab without issues. You can create merge requests without issues. You can create issues without merge requests. You can just straight disable the issues feature or the merge request feature if you would like to. So you, you are not obliged to use any of these to use GitLab. But in this case, I will. So I will just create a merge request. And it's fairly automated. So the title is filled for me. It will resolve that issue. It even uh, references here in the description of the merge request. I will assign this to me. So my teammates will know that, OK, Peter is working on this one. It's not just like floating in air. And I create the merge request. And this is the merge request to you. So the merge request and the issue view are, are very similar. Actually, so if you take a look at here, just okay, it doesn't contain changes, obviously. So if you take a look at here, they are very similar in terms of they are both like have this timeline view. So for the discussion, so the discussion feature is more or less the same. The point here is that in case of a merge request, you work on code. So there you can collaborate around the code itself. In this case, I don't have any changes, but I will fix that shortly. In case of an issue, you talk more about the idea or the planning. So what needs to be done? I, I like to say the issue is the place where you talk about what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And the merge request is the place where you are actually doing the stuff and you discuss the, the details of the implementation. But they are running in parallel. They are just for different personas because a project manager might not take a, look, a deep look into merge requests because why would he or she read the code itself? And vice versa with the issues. Issues might contain much more information for a project manager or a dev lead than a software engineer, because here you can track due dates, you can have iterations, milestones, so you can have an actual project plan on the issue side. While on the merge request side, it's all about the code and pipelines and the technical stuff. So this is, I just wanted to show you quickly how, how these two are correlating to each other. The next step I want to show you is the pipelines feature of GitLab. So this part of the demo was just about, okay, this is how you create an issue. This is how you create a merge request. On top of that, it's pretty much the same as in Bitbucket, actually. It's just the UI is different. The integration is, the, the, the experience between these two features of GitLab looks different, but the concepts are more or less the same. What I would like to show you is the CI/CD features of GitLab. So how you can, let's imagine you are in the same shoes as I am in this demo. You just imported your project. Obviously, it doesn't have any automation set up because even if you had pipelines in Bitbucket, those cannot be imported into GitLab. So GitLab uses a different format for describing pipelines. So because of that, you either need to manually migrate, like rewriting your pipelines, to have them in GitLab, or you need to build them from scratch. And this is something, by the way, a little bit of advertisement, something that our great partner, Efficode, can do for you by, I mean, like helping with the moving the pipelines or building new pipelines just for GitLab. End of the advertisement block. <laughs> Back to the demo. So here you can just really quickly set up a pipeline with GitLab, just like let's say, a standard pipeline. This feature is called Auto DevOps. And all you need, you need to go to the settings. Disclaimer, for Auto DevOps to work, you need to have a Kubernetes cluster integrated with GitLab. I won't cover that in this, in this demo because that's another one hour of demo setting that up. But the capabilities which I'm showing you with Auto DevOps and what a GitLab pipeline can do for you with just minimal setup can be achieved without Auto DevOps. So you can set up the same pipeline without a Kubernetes cluster. You would be missing one or two features, but like 80% of what I will show you is completely available 
without the Kubernetes cluster. It's just for me, for the demo purposes, it's just much easier to just click auto DevOps and then you see everything what GitLab is capable of. of. But having the same amount of effort, you can have the same pipeline just without the Kubernetes features, which again are like 20% of what I will show here. So I will just say default auto DevOps. This means that whenever GitLab cannot find a, a GitLab pipeline in your repository, it will just fall back to auto DevOps. And it's already kicking off a build, I think, at least it should be. So yeah, it's kicked off a build. We won't wait for this one because it takes almost nine or 10 minutes to run the whole deal. So I will just switch to another project, which I prepared for this demo, which is the same project, the same things I did, the only difference that the pipeline has already run. So I will just switch over to that project, which is this one, the finished workshop repository. And here I can show you the pipeline already. So it already run without getting into the details of GitLab pipelines, because again, that's a very broad topic. I don't want to spend that much time here. I just want to show you that by enabling auto DevOps, you get a lot of security scanners out of the box. As you can see here, the test stage, we have many, many different scanners. These are not even all of our scanners. These are just the ones that supports Python. Depending on the programming language that you use, there can be more, there can be less. So for example, JavaScript is more supported from our side. In case of JavaScript, auto DevOps would turn on more scanners. In case of Rust, for example, which we support in a minimal way, then you would have just one or two scanners. Point here is that these scanners are there out of the box in GitLab. You don't pay extra. These are not like another feature that you have to buy. In case of GitLab, you just want buy license. And then in this case, the ultimate one, because the ultimate has the security features. And then these scanners you have out of the box in GitLab as a feature that you just need to enable either by using something like auto DevOps, or if you are more advanced user, you can create your own pipelines and just include these scanners there. Just a disclaimer here. And the one last thing I would like to show in this demo, again, not digging really deep. I just wanted to show you how easy it is to set up a pipeline that actually builds your application, tests it, scans for vulnerabilities, deploys into production. So I can actually show that, for example, here environments, it's already running in a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, that's not a great demo because it's already died, I'm sorry. So. This is an old demo I set up almost a month ago, and the Kubernetes cluster just went away out of the <laughs> out under the out under the instance. So I won't be able to show you the production environment, but you better believe me, this could run in a production environment by this. But the main point I really want to cover here is not this one, not the Kubernetes stuff, because that's very specific to certain audiences. What I really want to cover here is the security features of GitLab because. That's what we see with our customers that brings the most value to their projects when they move to GitLab is that GitLab has these security features out of the box. I showed you how easy it is to turn them on. So they are just turned on by clicking that one checkbox or just setting up a simple pipeline. Again, if you don't want to use Kubernetes instead of the checkbox, you would create a pipeline, but is the more or less the same amount of effort, by the way, just to enable these scanners. And then here in the secure feature, I can show you already some of the features we do. So the security dashboard is a place where you can just quickly take a look. It's really a high view, high level overview, like a bird's eye view of, okay, what's going on in my project. And that's what I said previously, that this project is extremely vulnerable. It's on purpose. So that's how it is, as you can see more than almost 2000 issues from the security point of view. But this itself, it doesn't give too much information, this view. So this is just really just taking a look and, and get a heart attack that, oh my God, I have more than 1000 issues. But to get the information about what are those issues actually, you can jump to two features that I would like to cover here, the vulnerability report and the dependency list. So there are many other security features here. These are the ones I would say are the most 
accessible and the easiest to get value out of as soon as so like immediately after moving to GitLab. So as you saw, I, I enabled these scanners and now GitLab scan my source code with many different ways. So many different scanners have run and it generated me a vulnerability report where I can take a look at each of the issues that are in my application. And as you can see that there are many tools that GitLab supports. By the way, you can integrate your own. If you are using a third-party security software, it's possible to integrate as just one more tool in this report. That's a nice feature. But out of the box, we have all of these scanners already. So here you can have a summary of all the issues that you are facing. Very important, you can export this page. So it will be a CSV file, but you can export it. So if you need some, need it for some audits or some security reporting inside your organization that's there, it's accessible not just from the UI, but you can automate it with an API. So you can generate these reports for people who don't have access to GitLab in an automated fashion. And let's say I want to know more about, okay, what's this? I mean, this in itself doesn't say much, right? It's just a bunch of random characters to me and an identifier. Okay, but what this is, right? So what's happening in my code? I click on that and here you have a very detailed explanation. What's the problem? Where the problem is going, coming from? And what can you do to mitigate that problem? All again, out of the box, there in GitLab, you don't need to do anything other than enabling the scanners itself. And another nice feature showing the whole integration of the whole GitLab platform, so this DevOps lifecycle, that here from the issue that I have, I can just, I mean, the security issue, I can just create an issue in the backlog. So if I would click on this button, that will create a new backlog item, and the rest of my team will be aware of, okay, we need to fix this, pro fix this issue. And the work can already start. Most of the time, these issues are like just upgrade, right? So upgrade your dependencies and you are fine, but sometimes not. So sometimes you have to actually need to make code changes to your own application logic. And that would be here as well. So the issue would have the same description and you can start the whole workflow, right? So you create a merge request that brings changes to your application that might be insecure. You get a security warning. You create an issue from the security warning. You create a merge request from that. It fixes the issue. And then it and then you merge the initial version of the code that you wanted to. So it's jumping back some levels, but you can shift left the whole security scanning, and you are not doing it before release or when you are already in production and you have an issue. But you can catch these issues right in the middle of development, right before anything bad happens to your application, your customers, or your organization, because you run into any of these issues. So that's the real value here. And one more thing before uh, wrapping this demo up is the dependency list, very similar to the vulnerability, re vulnerability report. Sorry, as a Hungarian, this is the most difficult word that I can pronounce in English. I mean, literally, I, I cannot think of a, a worse English word than this one to pronounce. So dependency list is very similar, but it has a different focus. So it's not just about vulnerabilities because the vulnerability report can tell you issues about your the code that you wrote, your own application. Dependency list focuses on exactly just your third party dependencies. So packages that you are using or Docker containers that you are using. And the beauty of this is that this is a software bill of materials in Europe, not all the countries require this. In the US, it's strictly required if you make do business with the with the US government that you must ship a software bill of materials next to your application. So you must be able to prove to the government that the code I'm shipping is secure, the dependencies my code is using is secure. And this is the feature that we developed just for that use case. And obviously now in Europe as well and the rest of the world, this feature is getting a lot of tractation from our customers because security is more and more a concern for all governments all over the world, all authorities. So if you are working in that industry, this feature might be really useful because it's out of the box. It's just there. So as, as soon as you enable that scanning, the dependency scanning that I showed you earlier in the pipeline, you just have this out of the box. And similarly to the vulnerability report, you can just export it. It will be a JSON file. 
a given schema. I don't remember the schema name, but this is a standard as well in the industry. So you can just use that JSON file as it is, or you can generate another report in another format if you would like to also available from an API. So pretty much the same thing, just a different focus than the vulnerability report. So yeah, pretty much that's it. I would say these are the ones that I just quickly wanted to show you. So this is how GitLab with, as you have seen, not much effort. I mean, obviously I know what I am doing because I've done this demo a thousand times before, but stepping one step back, if you are doing it for the first time, it's not much more complex than that. So we covered this in what, 20 minutes, half an hour at most. It's not like you need weeks or days to do this, to do such an integration uh, migration from Bitbucket and also to enable these features of GitLab that I hope I was able to demonstrate can bring a lot of value to your, to your customers and to your organization and through that to your customers. So Peter, I would say, oh, yep, sorry. Sorry, if I, if I may interrupt, we've had a really great question in chat okay. from Alexandra. Uh, okay. The question goes, can you get updates to the security databases with a limited internet connection, such as running a proxy or a semi a gap um, for both the security dashboard and dependency scanning? Yes, that's a very, very good question. Comes up a lot of times, especially with customers who are dealing with, let's say, the government or other agencies. Yes, you can do that. So we do have a lot of customers who are running GitLab in so-called so, so air-gapped as you mentioned, Alexandra, air-gapped environments. If you go to our documentation, which is docs.gitlab.com, there's a full section of the docs just about that use case. So how can I host GitLab? How can I keep it up to date? And the whole security features that I showed you, so all the scanners, they are integral parts of your GitLab install. So Technically, under the hood, there are a bunch of Docker images that the pipeline is using to run the scans, but these are shipped with GitLab. So whenever you update GitLab, the software itself in this air-gapped environment, you are implicitly updating your scanners as well. So it's not like, not like you need to keep them updated independent of each other. You upgrade GitLab, and there you have the latest version of the scanners as well. Pretty much that. I hope that answers your question. But I assume it does. But if not, ask away. We are here just for that. You are welcome. So yeah, uh, going back to the slideshow, we did the demo, closing remarks, just a couple of words about GitLab. So I hope I was able to show you the value that GitLab can bring on the operational level, so the day-to-day -day level of a developer or an or a IT pro. But I just wanted to iterate on the fact that that's what we see, what you can see on this slide from our customers. So this is direct feedback from our customers. There was a survey and we see that the payback period, so the investment that you have to make into GitLab by buying the license, more or less, or in case of self-hosting, setting up the infrastructure is paid back in six months. Usually we see that these are the main points that our customers can save on much faster cycle time. Obviously, if you can ship faster, your customers will be happy. You get more customers, you have more money, better user experience, higher productivity. I think I showed you how easy it is to move in between different parts of GitLab. And the more familiar you get with GitLab, it just gets faster. Fewer tools, lower integration costs. You are paying one license, you're not paying multiple licenses, and you are not paying for integration between those tools as well. It's very simple, flat price, all features included. And fewer software renders, license cost reduction. I think that doesn't need much more explanation. Uh, why GitLab for security? I think I showed you how it is. It's just a little bit of context from the, from the industry. So we see a lot of security uh, attacks rising up in the past. This is something that GitLab can absolutely help with. I hope the demonstration was a good demonstration of that, how it can happen. And 
just a very important one, I wanted to point this out quickly, the GitLab DevSecOps survey. So we do this survey every year. We are, I think we are already doing it for this year, but the results from last year are up on our website. So if you go to this URL or use this QR code about the gitlab.com slash developer dash survey, there you can just download this report. It's a bunch of, I think it's 10 or 20 pages, not a long PDF by any means. You can read it in an hour or so. And this is what the industry sees, or this is what the industry tells us, how the security landscape around DevOps tools look like now. What are the trends? What are the main issues that development teams around the globe are struggling with? And obviously, we at GitLab, we think that we have an answer to that by using our tool. That's how you can <laughs> mitigate those issues. But I think it's very, it's a very... Uh, objective survey, even through it was made by us. I think it's it's a very fair uh, evaluation of GitLab. So I would say even as a GitLab employee, it's a good one. So even if I wouldn't be a GitLab employee, I would I would read it. It's a great one. And that's what I usually say that I am paid to sell GitLab, right? That's why I'm getting my salary. So don't believe me. Believe what the industry is saying. Believe what the customers of GitLab and of other vendors are saying about what are the trends, what you what you can save on, how you can use GitLab, etc. These are all in this service. So don't trust me, trust other people who are not paid by GitLab to sell GitLab to you. That's an important one, a life lesson of this demo, I would say. And I would just like to hand it over to Dan to quickly uh, wrap up this presentation. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Peter. And let me first say, before I do dive into this slide, uh, thank you very much for a very informative and well-presented uh, presentation there. That was really, really great. Thank you. Uh, so just a couple of notes before we do wrap up and say goodbye. As I mentioned earlier, this webinar has been brought to you by a partnership between EffiCode uh, and GitLab. Uh, and this partner, uh, partnership really is a strong one. We at EffiCode are a certified training partner, uh, along with having attained multiple other badges and certifications, some of which you can see just on the slide there uh, during our time working together. So we we at EffiCode really are in a great place to help advise, uh, discuss any opportunities or, of course, pain points uh, that you might be experiencing with your current DevOps tool suite. Um, as Nair, I think, mentioned in the chat, the webinar has also been recorded. So if you would like to rewatch it um, or, of course, share it with your wider team, then it will be sent out to all of you. Uh, it will also be shared, I imagine, on some social media uh, platforms. So it will uh, make its way up to the wider audience as well. So hello to everybody in the future if you are watching. Uh, but for now, that is it from us. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed providing it. Uh, if you have any questions on anything that you've seen, or indeed anything that you would like uh, help on in the future, such as performing migrations, then please do reach out to myself or another member of the EffiCode team who will be more than happy to discuss all of our professional service offerings for you. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And if you still have some questions, please don't hold back. We still have a couple of minutes. I still have a couple of minutes, so I'm really happy to answer if you have any more questions. But if not, then thank you very much for your attention. And I hope just I can just uh, reiterate on what Dan said. I hope it was as fun for you as it, as fun it was for us to prepare and deliver. And we hope that you uh, take away some useful information from this session here. Okay. Great. I will just stop sharing. And I think we can stop the recording as well. Mm -hmm.